the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the City Strong Broadcast. Listen, we're about to go into an incredible time at the City of David. I'm preaching a message entitled, Choices Matter. Have you ever been in a place to where you had to make a decision and at the crossroads, you didn't know exactly what you were going to do, but when you make the right decision, you have a gut instinct that now everything is going to work out for the good. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about how in your decision making is going to be a great overflow place. Come on, join us at the City of David. We're grateful for Elder Mark Moore and the YLCTV Network family. And this is going to be an amazing time. We'll see you after service. Jesus, have your way, God. Send your miracles. Send your rain. In the name of Jesus, burn away everything that's not like you. Burn away everything that's not like you. In the name of Jesus, so that we can be your people, God. Worshiping in spirit and in truth, in the name of Jesus. For you said in your word that if you be lifted up, you will draw all men. So now, God, as we lift you, we pray that you do the drawing. As we lift you, we pray now, God, that you do the drawing. Draw us closer, my son of God. Draw us closer in the name of Jesus. Whatever the people of God are standing in need of, we pray. 
about praise because I'm trying to help you live and if you don't ever give God praise then you are now making a decreasing into your life range your life cycle I am diminishing my life every time I don't give God praise but when I have the audacity when I've got the unmitigated God to open my mouth and give him praise in spite of everything that I've got going on everything ain't good no but all things work together for good hallelujah Hallelujah. I know this in last week. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you this. One thing that we've got to understand, we've got to understand the scripture. And we're going to Luke chapter 5. But when the Bible says that all things work together for good, what we do most of the time, we put all things work together for the good. And remember when you put the in front of anything, it becomes the definite article. And if it is the definite article, that means it specifies just a particular situation. So if that means that all things work together for the good, I limited God's work to just one situation. But when I read the scripture the way that it's written, and I say all things work together for good, that means every situation, there's no limitation, there's no specification. That means all things work together for good. If you know that it's working for your good, will you open up your mouth and give God an all good praise? Give him an all good praise. Luke chapter number five. Let's get there. Bless his wonderful name. Uh, Luke chapter number five. We're going to start at verse number one. I got a couple of verses I want to read through, and uh, then we're going to talk, uh, discuss this, and then uh, we're going to move right along. Amen. Luke chapter number five, verse number one. Amen. We certainly give honor to the Lord. Uh, to our wonderful host, to the founder and visionary of this wonderful network, the YLC TV, uh, Elder Mark Moore. We certainly thank God for you. Amen. To the fragrance of the city of David. Amen. We thank God for Lady Stephanie. Amen. We give God praise for you. Amen. We honor the Lord. Amen. To all our deacons, elders, we certainly thank God for you. You, you, and especially you. We honor you in the house of God. Luke chapter number five. Verse number one, to all of you who are watching, we certainly thank God and we count it an honor uh, that you would chime in at, on this Monday afternoon uh, to hear what the Lord is saying. Amen. Luke chapter number five, verse number one, it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and to talk the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets for a drought. Let down your nets for a drought, excuse me. Verse 5, and Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down thy net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Oh, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment, this space and history that can never be duplicated or replicated. We honor you, Father, for who you are and what you're doing. Now, as always, let every eye sit down. 
except for the great I am, do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now, Holy Spirit, you're the better preacher, so I pray you preach to me, preach for me, and preach out of me. It's in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus we pray, and every heart says amen. On the way down to your seat, look at a neighbor and type this in the comment section. Choices matter. Choices matter. As we look deliberately at this text, one of us, one thing that we must argue is that uh, the differentiation between the Gospels. And uh, as we understand this about the Gospel, we understand this is the physician Luke. And anytime we talk about the dichotomy between the Gospels, we always make reference to that Luke was a physician, a doctor, a detailed individual who captured things unlike Matthew and Mark. Matthew's entitlement was to the Jews while Mark wrote to the Gentiles. Luke was the physician and John wrote to a universal church. When we understand the power of what Luke writes in his Gospels, we understand that there are certain details that we have to pull out of scripture that will help us in any modern day or contemporary time. As we jump right into Luke chapter 5, we understand that it comes to pass that God now is about to go into one of the ships. And uh, verse number 1 says that they stand by the lake of Gennesaret. Now one of the things that you must understand is that whenever names are important and whenever names have an identity... You cannot overlook what they stand for. Gennesaret is a place full of multitudes and uh, uh, prosperity and increase. It's fruitful, this place, Gennesaret. And so when the enemy tries to make what something stands for go against what it's really meant to do, the enemy will make your mind feel as though that you have lost it. I'm saying this, that uh, there are times that God calls you to a particular place and you don't see what God has called you there for, and frustration, depression, and even vexation and anxiety, it steps into the mist, and you feel as though that I'm in the wrong place. But there are times that you're in the right place just at the wrong time. That, that there, there, there are times that you are in the right place, but yet you don't have enough patience to endure what God is about to bring to pass. Can I tell you, the word of God says you have to let patience have her perfect work. And uh, whenever you allow patience to have her perfect work, I can deal with that in a whole nother manner. Uh, we have to understand that patience is going to work for the body of Christ when we wait upon the Lord. Uh, as we understand, Jesus now, there are two ships standing by the lake. And um, the fishermen have gone out to wash their nets. Jesus had a choice. And uh, because Jesus had a choice, he had the ability to show his manhood or he had the ability to show his divinity. I believe now that if Jesus has a choice and he has to make choices, why do we, as the people of God, get frustrated and get upset with the fact that when we have to make choices, uh, we get upset to the fact, to the degree, that we have to, we're put in situations to make a decision. Most people don't want to make decisions. You want things handed to you. Can I tell you that the Lord is saying that this is the season that you've got to make decisions for yourself. And you have to be very conscious about the decision that you make because it could be a matter of life and death. I'm going to say that again. You must be conscious about the choices that you make in this next season and be deliberate about these choices because it could be a matter of life and death. It could be the matter of poverty and wealth. It could be a matter of friend or foe. It could be a matter of going forward or being set back. But you must be deliberate about the choice that you make. When we look at the dictionary and we understand the word choice, it is an act of selecting or making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities. When we make decisions, we, don't, we, we have to consider the fact of the pros and the cons for each decision. Because there are times that we are presented opportunities that could be good on both sides. 
lives. We're presented with opportunities that literally will make us flourish in both accounts. But when one makes a deliberate decision, you are good with the fact that even though I don't see it at the time, I understand that his purpose and his destiny is going to outweigh what I may see in an instantaneous moment. We cannot make decisions based upon spontaneous or instantaneous moments because sometimes we don't weigh out all of the options. I am learning more in my life that when you are patient, God has the ability and he has the proclivity to begin to speak to you about the whole encounter. Most of us, we make decisions based upon what we see. We don't make decisions based upon what we know. And so if we make decisions based upon what we see, the eyes sometimes has a tendency to make us see more than what we thought about. Hallelujah. Your mind was given to you for a reason. Your eyes were given to you for a reason. Your ears were given to you for a reason. Your mouth was given you to you for a reason. And sometimes we get the body confused. Hallelujah. And we use the mind for the mouth. We use the mouth for the mind. We use the mouth for the ears. And we get the body confused. Come on, it sounds like something we know about. You've got teachers who are preachers. You've got preachers who are pastors. You've got pastors who are worship leaders. You've got worship leaders who are trying to be prophets. And all the time when we get the body confused, then the body cannot be fitly joined together to work the unique assignment that God has called us to do. Hallelujah. When we understand now, when we use our mind for what it's processed for, the mouth is to verbalize and to announce, but the mind is to process and to stabilize. Can I say that again? Again, the mouth is to verbalize and to announce. However, the mind is to process and to stabilize. When you make a conscious and a deliberate decision, although you don't speak it out of your mouth yet, you are good with what's going to come out of your mouth next. Can I tell you, this is how faith works. We have been bamboozled in the body of Christ. We think that faith, hallelujah, does not have a process the devil is a liar. Faith has a process because faith starts in an inward place. And when we have faith, now it stabilizes us. It stabilizes us so much so that it now comes to our mouth. And what stabilized us, what processed internally, now comes out in verbal communication. I only say it because I processed it. I only speak it because I internalized it. I only speak it in the name of Jesus because it came from an inward place. You just don't speak just because you want to speak. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. As a man thinketh, so is he. Hallelujah. So he begins to deliberately make a decision. He conscientiously makes a decision. Even though he is 100% man and he's 100% divine, he conscientiously makes a decision. He decides to go to the boat where Simon is. Can I deal with Simon for just a moment? Because Simon and Peter uh, reside in the same body, but Simon and Peter are not the same person. Because when we look at Peter, we understand the Bible says, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We talk, we shout, we dance all the time about Peter because Peter was the one who was strong. Peter was the one that gets three cuss words a year. Peter was the one that could fight. Peter was the one that we want to be like and we want to use as a disclaimer when we sin. Peter is the one that we know that was close to Jesus, but Peter also was the one who had to grow into the place that Peter was. Peter wasn't always Peter. Peter started out being Simon. And uh, Simon was the total opposite of Peter. Simon, while Peter was strong and Peter was uh, vocal and Peter oftentimes was impulsive, Simon was very reluctant. Simon was very quiet. As a matter of fact, the word Simon means weak. And so Simon was a weakling. Simon was someone who needed the hand of God. And I know sometimes we don't authenticate uh, a weakness as a strength. I know that I just messed you up. But sometimes we have to authenticate weakness as a strength. Because the Bible says he makes us 
perfect in our weakness. He'll make our strength perfect in our weakness. We have to authenticate that weakness is a gift from God at times. Because what God will do, he will allow us to be in a place where we can't do it on our own. And so now he needs, we need rather, the strength of God to come in and to deliberately do things for us so that we will make the right decisions. Hallelujah. Ah, here we are now. Jesus makes the deliberate or the intentional decision to go to the boat where Simon is. Can I tell you that if Simon is weakness and Jesus is the power and the strength, Jesus is literally coming into the place to hold you up because you ain't strong enough to do it on your own. When you get strong enough to do it on your own, you're going to sink. When you get strong enough to do it on your own, you're going to fail. I don't care how good you are as a preacher. I don't care how well you can articulate and uh, you can contextually go through the scriptures. When you feel as though uh, that you can do it on your own, you're going to sink. I don't care how well you can sing, how well you can modulate, how well you can put notes and chords, uh, lyrics together. When you feel as though that you can do it on your own, you're getting ready for the sinking place. The Bible declares in Proverbs that pride goes before for destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Now, in most instances, most of us in America and in the globe uh, united, we say that pride goes before the fall. And uh, that's not it. Pride goes before destruction. He gives you an inkling of clarity of what's going to take place when you get in a prideful situation. First comes the fall, and then if you don't get yourself together, then comes destruction. Hallelujah. But when you submit yourself to the will of God, he's able to lift you up and pick you up in your time of weakness. Jesus now enters into the boat, and when he enters into the boat, the first thing that it says that Jesus begins to teach the people. And when he begins to teach the people, after he's taught them, he's encouraged them, he's strengthened them, now he gives them an assignment. Can I tell you that if you are in a place and you're not getting assignments after you heard the word of God, you're you're in the wrong place because after you've been taught now there has to be an assignment there has to be a motive for the teaching there has to be something that will make your life uh, compare to what the teaching method was so that when I leave I can deliberately act the way that the teacher prescribed or ascribed for me to do it I must understand the teaching that he or she has done for me I must now apply it to my life it's called application hallelujah most of us in school, we understood that we had to learn and it was only not for our benefit, not for our retention, but for us to pass the test. The application was that I will learn this long enough so that when the test comes, I'm able to pass it. To some degree, that's right. And to some degree, you need a more historical lesson. But in this time frame, what we call spirituality, you need to have application for the test because there are things that people will teach you because the test is on the way. And if you don't retain it in time enough or in enough time to pass the test, you won't really go through life in a joyful place. You'll always have the sad song, woe is me, hallelujah. But when I can apply what is being taught, it gives me the indication or it's the indicator that whatever was taught is a about to be my test. Can I tell you that God is getting you ready because there is somebody who's watching me who's about to make the biggest decision in their life. And if you don't deliberately make this decision and you just kind of fall into this decision, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. Can I tell you, make the decision on purpose got to move. Hallelujah. In this next place, after he uh, teaches them, he tells Simon now, I pray, thrust out a little from the land and uh, let your nets down for a drought. Now, 
Here is where my first point is. We must understand that we got to hear the teacher at his word. Ah, the Bible says that in the beginning God created the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the same was in the beginning was with him and there was nothing that was not made that was not made by him. Reference John 1, 1 through 3. Hallelujah. And if he now is giving you the word, you have to hold on to every word that he says. Hallelujah. Now, now, while we think that we are so smart and we have mastered the English language, the Bible declares that all scripture was inspired by that of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm working here. And uh, because all scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Bible says that he goes from the end to the beginning, we cannot argue the fact when Jesus says something because we think that Jesus made a mistake. But the Bible declares that all scripture Scripture is inspired by that of the Holy Ghost. He sits down in chapter 4 and he tells in the verse, chapter 5, verse 4, and he tells them to let down your nets. Hold on to that. Nets with the plurality. Let down your nets. You're going to catch something. You've got more than one place to put this in. Let down all of your nets. Hallelujah. Some of us, we're so uh, disobedient because we don't see what we see. We don't want to put our best efforts forward. Hallelujah. God told you that whatsoever you do, you do it wholeheartedly unto the Lord, not unto man. We've got preachers that literally won't preach the gospel because there's no crowds. We've got people who won't prophesy because there's no crowds. We've got people who won't give it their best because there's no crowd. And if God cannot trust you when there is no crowd, how is he going to trust you in the midst of the crowd? You've got to put your best foot forward. You've got to put your best effort forward when there are only 10 people in the house. You've got to put your best foot forward when you've only got five views. You've got to put your best put foot forward before you ever get tens and thousands of people who are viewing you because what God is doing, he's training you deliberately to see if your choices that you make are going to be the choices that he would make. Hallelujah. Because many of us will not make the decision or the choices that God would make because we're still trying to do it on our own. But you've got to listen to everything that he says. He says, go down and let down your nets. Nets with an S. Put that in the comment section. Put that in your notes. Nets with an S. He says, put down your nets and down for a drop. Verse 5, I'm moving. It said, and Simon answered to him and said, Master, we've told all night. All night, we've been working at this, and we've caught nothing. Ah, Pete Simon is telling him, "Listen, you, 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 the teacher, or you, 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 the, you the rabbi, you the teacher, you, 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 you teach people, you teach scripture, but, but this right here, I, I fish. Th th this is what I do, and I know I've been here all night, mm -hmm, and I ain't caught nothing. I know what the sea looks like. I know when there are some fish that are trying to bite. I know what it feels like when I'm about to get a, a multitude of fish. I know what it feels like when the increase." is about to come and some of you are like this you're telling the pastor you can't tell me how to sing my song you, 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 you can't tell me what songs to sing this is what I do I'm a singer I'm an artist but can I tell you this as a leader of the house you know who the praise and worship leader is come on I'm talking to you pastors ah the praise and worship leader is the pastor of the house and if he is not in a place to help articulate praise and worship I ain't talking about grabbing the mic. He's got to be the one who expresses praise and worship. Oh, God Almighty, more than anybody. Can I tell you this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Pack. In this place, there is a first chair, a second chair, and a third chair. Hallelujah. In the first chair, the first chair is the pastor. He's the creator here, and I'm talking about praise and worship on down. He's the one that helps create the praise and worship atmosphere because he's prayed behind the scenes. 
because he's been praying and interceding for the church. Hallelujah. So now he's the creator. He has the idea, the expression of praise. The praise and worship in any house should be an indicator of who the pastor is and the God that he serves. Can, can I tell you that again? The praise and worship in any house should be an indicator of who the pastor is and the God that he serves. And so the songs that you hear ought to be the songs that resonate with the man of God's heart. Secondarily, I've got to move. The second chair is the worship leader. And the worship leader now is the expression of the voice of the one who is the creator. The worship leader now has the heart of the pastor, yeah? And uh, because they have the heart of the pastor, they're able to articulate and maneuver through the song realm so that what needs to be communicated to the people is communicated to the people. Come on, I'm helping you here. And so now with the third seat, you have the third seat, which are the parishioners, the congregants, the members, the partners, whatever you call them. They become the support system. And in the support system, they are the people who now come into an agreement or an alignment with what the worship leader is doing. As a worship leader, I te as a pastor, I teach the worship leader that all the time it's an audience of one. However, it's an audience of one expanded. Hallelujah. The audience of one expanded now expands to the support system. Can I help you here? God is the first chair. Jesus is the second chair. And the Holy Ghost is the third chair. God is the originator, the authenticator. Jesus was the expression of who God is. And the Holy Spirit becomes the support of the expression. Hallelujah. And so when we understand what God is trying to get us to do, we will literally hold on to what God has given us from the beginning. You've always got to obey the teacher. Sit on down. Simon tells him, I've been doing this all night. And I ain't caught nothing. But because Master and, P and Simon didn't even understand that he was prophesying in the midst. You're the master, not only of the teach word, but you're the master of all things. I'm going to let down your net. Because you're the word. This is what Simon's saying. He don't even know that he's saying it. Because you're the word. And you go from the end to the beginning. You've already seen this. But Simon don't even know this is what he's saying. Because you are the word. I, I, I'm, I'm going to let down. I'm going to let it down. I'm going to let it down. I, I ain't got nothing to lose at this point. E either I'm going to not let it down and miss out what you might see. Or I'm going to let it down and don't get nothing. E either way, I ain't got nothing to lose. So I'm going to let down my net. Now, here's the issue that I've got with Simon. Simon, he don't listen. And this is when we start seeing Peter start to sneak into Simon. Because Jesus told Simon to let down your nets with an S, which implies that Simon had more than one net beside him. But Simon answered and said, nevertheless, at thy word, I'm going to let down thy net. Hallelujah. He obeyed him, but it was partial obey, obeying. And uh, when you are partially obedient, that's total disobedience. And even in a partial obedient place, there's enough grace, there's enough mercy that God can still allow you to get some of what you're going to get. But in this season, choice Choices matter. In this season, the uh, uh, decisions that I make, uh, they're mattering. I'm not trying to be totally disobedient on the account of partial obedience. Uh, if God told me to give $5,000, I don't give uh, $4,050. No, I give $5,000. If God told me to give $5,000, I don't give $2,500. No, I, if God told me to give $5,000, I don't give $500. I give uh, what God said to do because he's made provision on the other the side of the announcement. Hallelujah. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, glory to God. So now Simon lets down the nets. And when he lets down the net, the Bible says that he enclosed a great multitude of 
vicious. Now, it's my second point. All my life, I've been in school, and uh, when they taught me, they taught me there were certain words that you, in order to give them a distinction, you add an S or an ES to the word to make it plural. All my life, I, I thought things like child wasn't child's, it became children. They, they, they fixed it to make it plural. It, it, and children's is not a word. Uh, it's children makes a child plural. Uh, you've got words like dear. And whether you say dear or dear, it can be singular or it could be plural. Then they told me, then, then, Bree, they told me that fish, if it was fish, it was singular. If it was fish, it was plural. But I get to the word of God in verse 6 of chapter 5 of Luke. And it says they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. I can't get past to the next part to see the revelation because I can't get past what I thought was a grammatical error. And if you read the Bible with your understanding, you'll miss the revelation. We've got so many misunderstood people trying to interpret the revelatory experience of the word of God that they miss what God was saying. Hallelujah. When he now encloses a great multitude of fishes, it is not about a quantitative experience. No. When he encapsulates a great multitude of fishes, it's about the quality or the diversity of fishes. And so when he catches the fishes, instead of it being just one type of fish, he caps all types of fishes. He gets all type of fish. Hallelujah. He got goldfish. He got bass. He got trout, he got salmon, he got tilapia, he got croaker, he got white, he got all of the different fish. And a multitude of great fishes. Can I tell you uh, that God told me that in the midst of when you're giving your life over to him. Uh, when I say that you're going to be wealthy, uh, it just won't be in your finances. Uh, hallelujah. In this season, uh, when I provide wealth to you, uh, wealth is going to come in the form of financial prosperity. But then wealth is going to come in the form of health. Uh, wealth is going to come in the form of a prosperous marriage. Uh, wealth is going to come in the form of promotions on your job. Wealth is going to come in the form of miracles. We have limited the prosperity to currency. When the currency of the kingdom ain't even money. The currency of the kingdom is faith. And if you change your currency then and you put your currency to the, faith, to the kingdom and use faith, then he'll give you everything in this world pertaining to life and godliness. Who am I talking to? Your faith needs to be extended your currency needs to be exchanged and what God is getting ready to do he's getting ready to open up the doors for you for a multitude of fishes to come your way come on will you type that say there's a multitude of fishes that are coming my way my health is a little messed up but God is about to restore it my marriage is jacked up but God is getting ready to restore it my bank account is a little turned upside down but God is getting ready to restore it they're using me on my job but God is getting ready to restore it my personality my friendships they're messed up but God is getting ready to destroy restore it and it's all because of the choices that I made hallelujah sit on down this is my last point and we, we're going to close out from here and then, then they said and the net break. He got a, a diversity lady crumb. He got a multiplicity of fishes. It wasn't not only multiplicity. It didn't exclude that but it was just a diversity of multiplicity. Oh, I love that. Will you put that in the comment section? It is a multiplicity of diversity. That means he's giving you quantity and quality and diversity is coming to you. Come on, will you prophesy that? I feel that there. He's going to give you a multitude. That means he's giving you you much increase in diverse places. Hallelujah. I'm going to move on. Oh, glory to God. And then it says the net break. The net break. Now, now, now if I hear it and I'm not reading, I, I, and I need you real quick, 
Don't, don't, don't just trust me. I, I, need, I need you to get it. I need you to put it on your phone or uh, whatever you need to do on your laptop uh, right here wherever you're at. And I need you to read this with me because you ain't going to believe me if, unless I just say it. In Luke chapter 5, uh, verse number 6, the Bible says, And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and the nets break. Now, when you hear it and you, and you try to put it in context, Immediately, you think that break is B-R-E-A-K, like something is breaking apart, like it's switched or it's split down the middle, it's, it's tore, B-R-E-A-K. But in verse number six, he says, and the net break, B-R-A-K-E. Now, Brother Trent, this messed me up because I'm trying to figure out what, what is God talking about. And uh, when he said the net break, that means that it came to a, a stop. And, and I'm trying to figure out. This don't make sense to me. If it's going to break and it's going to come to a complete stop, then how am I being blessed when it comes to a stop? I kept reading the text, and it started to make a little more sense to me, Sister Camry. Uh, in verse 7, it said, And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the other ship, that they should come to help. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. Now, in context with the understanding of the word, if it was the B-R-E-A-K and the next break, then the boats would have never been filled. Because if the nets broke, then they would have went back down in the water. But because the net had a stopping point, the nets began to overflow and it began to go into the boat and the boat began to sink. This was all because of a disobedient or a miscommunication or a misunderstanding of what, hallelujah, of what Jesus said to Simon. What, what, what are you saying to me, Pastor? I, I, I'm saying this to you, that there are times that we just don't articulate or understand what Jesus is saying to us. And if we don't grab hold to the revelation, what will happen is we ain't ready for the blessing that's to come. Because Peter did not put himself in a place. And notice, I'm calling him Peter now. Hallelujah. He didn't understand the blessing. He wasn't ready for it because he didn't do what the Lord told him to do. The Lord said, let down your nets. And he just let down one net. And because it was so much blessing, he didn't have room enough to receive it. Come on, am I talking Bible? And uh, because he did not have room enough to receive it, uh, the boats begin to sink. Uh, hallelujah. You're in a situation right now, uh, and I want to talk to you, uh, that the blessings of the Lord uh, are about to overtake you, uh, that your boats uh, are getting ready to sink. Uh, here is the last part that you've got to understand. Uh, you've got to have conversion. Uh, when Jesus begins to show you blessings, uh, the Bible says in verse number 8, and when Peter saw this, he fell down to his knees and saying to him, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, oh Lord. Let me work this and we've got to go. In the midst of this, Simon now begins to say, no, I can be strong enough to handle this. I've got blessings that are about to come to me. And I've got to be in a position and in a place to make sure that I can handle what you're about to put upon me. Hallelujah. Bless your wonderful name. But he understands the sufficiency. He understands the holiness, the righteousness of God. Can I tell you that this is the season. You ain't got to point nobody out when they ain't doing right and they're getting blessed. That's okay. Let them do what they do. The blessing of the Lord maketh you rich and added with it no sorrow. I ain't mad at you if you ain't living right and you still trying to be blessed. But here is the place that we've got to understand. 
man that Simon now understands that he's a sinful man and I don't understand and I don't need this and I can't handle this because I'm not in righteousness I'm not in covenant relationship with you he now shows us two things number one that you ain't got to be saved to be blessed hallelujah and number two there's an added extension of blessings when you give your life to the Lord I'm tired of people misappropriating the scripture and saying that blessings don't fall upon those who don't know the Lord the devil is a liar he reigns on the just as well as the unjust but there's an extension of grace that's upon my life that I've got when I'm in covenant relationship with the Lord and now Peter begins to understand who he is in verse number five I believe it is he calls him master and teacher glory to the son of God because he taught and he was master over all but by verse number eight he switches his dialect and he switches his lingo and Peter begins to not only be called Peter but Peter now calls Jesus Lord because when you call him Lord instead of calling him master that means that you give him leeway and access to everything in your life will you look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor in the comment section that I'm teaching I'm calling him Lord because he had a rule over all my life I'm calling him Lord because he runs everything in my life he runs my health I ain't gonna have high blood pressure because he runs my life I ain't gonna have diabetes because he runs my health life I ain't gonna be broke because he runs my life and when I put it in the hand in the hands of the Lord he begins to make ways out of no ways so when my boat begins to sink he's got enough to pull me out of the water so that I'm not overwhelmed with the blessing will you look at a neighbor and tell your neighbor that what God is doing he's getting ready to put you in a place where I ain't seen where ear haven't heard neither hasn't entered the heart of man the thing that God has prepared for you and when he begins to open up the doors for you in blessings he will do it in such a way that you will begin to say Lord I'm unworthy of this blessing but can I rebuke you for one moment if God puts it on your life then that means you're worthy enough to handle it if God gives it to you that means that he was God enough to let you hold on to it can I tell your neighbor and tell him like this that in this season of what God is going to do he's going to allow me to be blessed he's going to allow my neighbor to be blessed Thank you so much for tuning in today for our wonderful broadcast. I pray today the word of God blessed you. I pray that you have found application. I pray you found strength. And I pray that you found that choice that you need to make. Remember now, in Luke chapter 5, in verse number 8, Peter now discovers Jesus in a new way. And we sing that today in the word of God. And he now goes from calling him master to calling him Lord. I believe that that was a transition, a transitional moment, a choice that he made in his life. Today, you may need to make a choice in your life, and the choice is salvation. The Word of God is clear and it says, choose this day who you will serve. Will it be life or will it be death? Will it be the enemy or will it be God? Today, you have the choice, and I want to offer you the plan of salvation. It's the greatest decision. It's the greatest choice that you could ever make. It is a life-altering and a life-changing decision. Will you do me this favor? If you've never, ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there are four simple principles that you've got to believe. And if you believe that it's simple, family, you're coming into the family of God. Number one, you've got to believe that he was born of a virgin and of that of the Holy Spirit. Take a moment. Realize, do you believe that? Number two, you must believe that he walked on this earth for 33 and a half years and he did work in ministry for three and a half years. Take a moment. We're getting there. You're halfway there. Number three, you've got to believe that he died an agonizing, pulverizing death, hung between two thieves, and there he was crucified in front of all of Jerusalem. And last but not least, you've got to believe that he holds all power in his hand. And he didn't just stay there, but he rose so that you and I could have access to eternal life. Family, I want to let you know 
that if you believe those four things, you're into the family of God. No longer do you got to rent, but he's got a mansion that he's prepared for you. I'm so glad that you're in the family of God. I'm so glad that you enjoyed this message. Do me a favor. Go and like, share, and subscribe to all of the City of Davis platform social media networks. It's going to be an amazing time because I believe that God is doing great things. Look at the neighbor and tell them it's happening at the city.